Hi, I'm Scott. Welcome to SynStuff. Today, we're going to be doing a deep dive. Everything you ever wanted to know about the incredible Roland JD800. Coming up. The JD800 is a digital synth, unabashedly digital synthesizer, 61 keys. It was the Roland flagship when it was introduced in 1991. It was sold for five years until 1996. It was a kind of a follow-on to the Jupiter. It was not a Jupiter, but it was a G Jupiter Digital 800 is what the JD stands for. So technically a Jupiter, but yes, it was the Roland's flagship synthesizer. It was, uh, like I said, released in 1991. One of the original designers of the JD-800 was actually involved in the development of the Juno 106. Synthesizer design had really kind of moved to a digital sense where everything was edited with numeric keypads and displays, and they wanted to get away from that back to kind of like the Juno 106 where all the controls are right there in front of you, which is why you have just tons of buttons and sliders sprayed across the control surface of the JD-800. It really was created with the intention of being this sound design monster getting away from that numerical editing of sounds on an LCD display. Although you can do that with this, but you don't have to, and why would you? Because you have all these sliders. There is one thing that when you talk about JD-800s, everybody always says is, what about the red glue problem? So the red glue problem is Roland's own doing. What they did is they, they this is a semi-weighted key bed, so it, the keys have weights in them. They're actually little steel weights in the bottom of each key at the very end. And it gives it a little bit of, of feel to it. So it, it doesn't feel like you're playing uh, like, this is non-weighted, this synthesizer up here. It's just a basic synth action, just a piece of plastic that you're hitting. Here, this has some heft to it. It bounces, it has a little more feel for, for a, a player. However, the epoxy in which Roland used to fasten those weights to the bottom of the keys was awful. And uh, after a number of years, especially if the keyboard was kept in a hot area, that epoxy just turned into red goo and it dripped down everywhere and it was really sticky and nasty. Uh, it would drip inside the keyboard, it would destroy the key bed circuit board, it would destroy the aftertouch, and so many JD-800s were lost just because the key beds just leaked red glue inside and, and ruined them. Now Roland did know about this problem and they issued a recall so that you could get a new key bed for free. Uh, once they discovered the problem, if yours was exhibiting that problem, which of course they all would at one time. Eventually they stopped doing that for free and they were still selling the keyboards. It was only $100, $200 to get a new key bed that did not have that problem. But of course that only lasted for so long, they ran out of the key beds and stopped it. So now we have the JD-800s that have the red glue problem and it's up to us to fix and restore them which is exactly what I did with this one. I did a, a video that I'll put a link to up here where I actually tore this synthesizer apart. I restored the key bed. I mean, it, it, the, this one was really bad. When it came to the red glue problem, it was everywhere. It was really poor shape. I replaced every switch. I replaced capacitors. I, I modified the aftertouch. Uh, so I did a lot of work on this synthesizer and that video is that restoration process that I did. The restoration and fixing of that red glue problem is uh, not a, a simple task. If you're not up to taking apart and perhaps even fixing broken circuit boards, uh, it's probably not a DIY one, but if you, you are experienced at fixing synthesizers, it's definitely something you can do. There are people that also do it uh, professionally that you can have them work on your synthesizer. The good news is that the vast majority of JD-800s that you're going to find for sale today have already had that red glue fix done to them. So the number of synthesizers that are still around with that red glue problem are not that many. So if you're going to go on Reverb and look for a JD-800, uh, I'll put a link here. You can click on that or I'll put it in the description below. And you can see there are usually some JD-800s for sale that have had that red glue problem fixed. Uh, a couple of years ago, these were well over $2,200 and sometimes $2,500. Uh, in the last six months, they've come down, like most other synthesizers, uh, to a more reasonable $1,500, $1,600 on reverb for a used example, a good used example of a JT-800. So it is a digital synthesizer. There is no analog anything in here. 
Back in the late 1980s, Roland brought out the D50, which used LA synthesis. LA synthesis was kind of a, a hybrid, and it was a compromise because they wanted to use samples because samples sounded so good, you can make it sound like anything, but computer memory was extremely expensive. So what they did in the D50 was they used a tiny, tiny little sample just for the attack <laughs> portion of the sound, and then they would use a regular digital synthesizer oscillator for the sustained part of the sound, and it worked really well. When it came to the JD-800, it's a number of years later, memory is definitely cheaper, so they made some changes. Instead of using it, the sample just for the attack, they used it for the entire sound. Now, it might have been just a, a simple synthesizer, like you had a, a sawtooth, in which case it's just a sawtooth, almost like a wavetable, kind of, but it is a sample. So it's kind of like the old Gaia, where it had samples that were used as oscillators. This does the exact same thing. The sawtooth oscillator in here is just a, a sawtooth sample that is looped. The difference with this is that it now uses looping in the samples themselves. So you could have a sample of, for instance, a, a pluck sound, and you have that, that percussive pluck at the very beginning of the sample, and then maybe a drawn out tail as the sample fades away. So the sample would consist of the pluck at the beginning, and then it would loop the sustained part to give you that long sustained part. So instead of using digital synthesizers like the D50 to create the sustained portion of the sound, it would just use a sample that it looped over and over. Let's see if we can find something like that. Here's a perfect example of that. It's a, an organ sound, and this is uh, an internal? No, it's a card sound. So here's the, here's the sound. You can hear there's a, a pluck sound and then sustain part. Now you could have that all in one sample where you have just the, the pluck and then the sustain part, but with the JD-800, you can actually layer up to four samples or tones as they call them. So in this case, we have four tones. Here's the first one. Here's the second one. Here's the third one. And here's the fourth one. So there's that clunk of the mechanical keyboard. If we add both clicks together, we get that. And if we add the tones in, we get we get that organ sound. So that's how this synthesizer constructs sounds. The other difference they did make in the JD-800 from the D50 is that they upped the sample rates to 44.1. Uh, I don't remember what they were in the D50. I think they were 24, don't quote me on that, but this one has full 44.1 kilohertz sample rates, so the samples are much higher quality. They only had four megabytes to work with, so they did have to cram things in there, but we do get things like sound effects. I don't know why they wasted memory on that, but you can get sound effects because it's sampled. It has a, a set of, a, I think it was 101, if I remember correctly, different tones or samples that you can select from. You have 64 patch storage, and you can overwrite those as you need be. There's also data cards that you can put in the back, one uh, that is a waveform data, so that's more samples, and then a data card where you can store another 64 patches. There's other data cards that you can get that, that allow you to bank them so you can store several hundred different patches. And there were preset cards that Roland sold that had more factory presets. So I have one in here that's called, uh, I think it's Dance, but we're actually the sounds we were listening to are on the card. So those are all sounds in the card. I can switch to the internal sounds. You can switch back and forth between internal presets and external card presets. And of course, you can just pull the card out and stick another card in if you wanted more presets. In 1993, Roland brought out the JD-990, which was a rack mount version of this. Uh, it had more presets in it, and it had more card slots, so you could put more cards into it. But other than that, it was more or less the same engine as this one. This was the last of the Roland and probably most of the digital synthesizers that had discrete processors. And what does that mean? Well, modern synthesizers like the guy up here, it has one processor that does everything. It scans the key bed to see what key you're pressing. It, it 
it assigns voices, it does all the presets, it does everything. So it's it's tasked with move, doing all that stuff in loops. And because of that, if you press a key, uh, it might have a slight delay before it gets scanned and played. Now, on a modern synthesizer like the Gaia 2 with a high-speed processor, it's not so noticeable. But on other digital synthesizers of, of the day, it was definitely noticeable. This one is different because instead of having one processor that does everything and, and, and things like keyboard scan might have to wait, this one has discrete processors. There's one that does the key bed scanning. There's one that controls the filter. There's one that controls the effects and there's DSP effects on here. And because of that, it had the real analog feel where, like a Juno, where the key bed is connected directly into the generating engine. So you have absolutely no delay between when you hit a key. And, and those, especially noticeable if you hit, if you play chords. Well, this is a, a monophonic sound, but we're in the other digital sense of the time. If you were to play a chord and then you look at it on the scope, you could see that the, the, the individual notes are not actually sounding at exactly the same time, whereas the JD800, they were because of those discrete processors. That was expensive for Roland to do, and after the JD800, they and pretty much every other synthesizer manufacturer stopped doing that. That made this a real professional player's synthesizer. Okay, let's pick a polyphonic sound. And you can see that we have 24 notes of polyphony. If I turn all these tones off and I put the top note on, and then if I start playing notes at the bottom, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, one, two, three, four. As soon as I hit 24, it steals the note from the top. So 24 note polyphony. However, there are four tones, remember, up to four tones. Every sound doesn't have to have four tones, but a lot of them do. This one is one that has four tones. So every key press uses up four notes of polyphony. So if I do the same thing with all four tones turned on, there's our top note. One, two, three, four, five, six. I got to six and I ran out because six times four is 24. So if you have all four tones, you have six notes of polyphony. So those 24 notes are spread out among those those four tones in single mode. So the the synth has two modes. One is single mode and one is multi-mode. Multi-mode, you get four actual patches playing at once, plus a special part, which is usually drums. So, and those four parts appear on MIDI channels one, two, three, and four. And of course your drum channel shows up on MIDI channel 10, which is your drum channel. The special part assigns a different tone to every key. So if I were to go to a special setup, There's my drums, and you can see each key has a different sample on it. If I were to go into my multi-part, and I can then assign four different parts, and each of those parts can have a different patch. Why would you do that? Well, mainly because you can then spread uh, those patches across your key bed, so you could have a bass sound up here and a string sound up here, up to four across the key bed. Or you can have them layered, or you can actually kind of blend them from one to the other. It's very, very flexible in that way. That means that the JD-800 is four part multi timbral and five if you count the drum special part. However, again, those 24 notes of polyphony are spread across all of that. If you have a multi with four parts in it and each of those four parts has four tones and you were to have those all layered, that means every key you press is using up 16 voices and you're gonna run out of polyphony after you have one key press. Obviously, you're not gonna do that very often, but that's just something to, to remember that for a multi timbral synthesizer, which was great at the time, it did not have a lot of polyphony. But again, 24 notes of polyphony was stupendous at the time, but you do have limitations in multi-mode as a result. There are other limitations as well. And those limitations are DSP limitations when it comes to effects. It does have effects. If you're in single mode, you have a wide variety of effects to choose from. And if you think about it, each of these tones is like a separate synthesizer instance, just like on the on the original Gaia. 
And so each of these tones has its own set of effects. You have a three band semi-parametric EQ, and I say semi-parametric because the low and high are just shelves. You can adjust the Q on, and then there's a mid band that you can adjust the frequency uh, that you, and also the Q. Uh, so you can adjust the shelf level and cutoff for the high and low, and then a, a standard parametric mid band. Uh, you also have a distortion and enhancer, which just adds harmonics. A phaser, a spectrum, which is uh, basically a six band parametric EQ, mostly used like as a, as a comb filter. Uh, delay, chorus, reverb. And that's per tone, remember. If you're in multi-mode, you get much, much less, whereas you have a three band semi-parametric EQ for each, each patch. Uh, and then you have chorus and reverb global for all the, all the sounds together. Let's have a look at the controls and how you actually operate this synthesizer. But before we go any further, can I get you to take just five seconds and subscribe to my channel? I really appreciate it. It really helps me out when you do that. Just click subscribe. Let's get back to the video. I'm gonna show you the controls and sound design techniques and all about the engine, about the JD-800. And of course that applies to the JD-800. If you have a JD-990, the same exact things apply as it does if you have the JD-08 boutique version of this remake synthesizer that Roland put out a number of years ago, or if you use the JD-800 Roland Cloud software instrument, of course, all these techniques are gonna apply. And even if you use the JD-800 model inside the Roland Phantom EX, which I have here, that also, applies because everything I show you here on the JD-800 exists in that model as well. Over here we have the controls that tell us how we're actually going to be controlling the synthesizer overall. You can see I'm in single mode or multi-mode. You can switch back and forth. We can adjust the tuning of the instrument and change some of the, the high-level functions, MIDI menu. If we're in multi-mode, this is how we switch between the different parts and what's going to be inside each of those parts. If we see down in the in the display here, I'm going through part three and four. So you can see here's all the different parts that are playing. And when we're in multi setup, we can edit the individual parts and change. Hey, this is going to be receiving on this channel or we can change the level pan where it's actually going to output uh, the, the where it's going to feed the effects effect level and so on. So um, and then here's our effects. We can set up the different delay in the chorus and the reverb. Um, special setup is where we set up the individual drum samples. If we go in here, we can actually go in and change what each key is going to press. So right now we can see this is a kick. If we wanted to, we could change that to whatever we wanted from any of the samples that are in there. Okay, let's go back out of here back to single mode. And we'll talk about the, the, the patch layers. Now you can see I have a sound in here that is called Crystal Roads. This is a very famous sound that was used absolutely everywhere. You couldn't go through the 1990s without hearing songs made with this sound. And you can see it's made up of three different tones, A, B, C, or actually B, C, and D. So why is that? Well, that usually means the sound designer added something in there that we could add. So let's listen to what's in tone A. Well, nothing. In this one, they added nothing. In this one, interestingly enough, tone C has only a very quiet sound, or tone D has the percussive sound, and tone B has what we would know as the main sound. So if we add them together, there's our sound. So if we go into a different sound, let's see here we have a bass sound. Let's listen to what this has. Tone A, just that, that sub bass. There's that pluck sound. Just kind of a thumping sound or like a string sound if we hit it hard kind of a slap sound guitar slap and then d has a like a square wave bass so if we turn all those back on we get the the end result is this So 
So there's how the sounds are constructed with the different layers. When we want to edit the sounds, we can hit active here and it tells us which layer we're actually editing or we can edit more than one at a time. So right now we're editing tone A because it's flashing, which means any changes we make to here are going to affect tone A. If I wanted to change, oh, let's see the cutoff frequency. That will affect only tone A. However, if we wanted to, we can make adjust the cutoff frequency on all four tones at the same time, because all of these are flashing, that means any changes I make on the controls here are going to affect all four tones. So if I adjust the cutoff now, So it's a, it's a really great way of doing fast editings because there's so many controls on here that if you wanted to do the same thing and set the same value to all these different or mul multiple tones at the same time, you can do that. Down here is where we can edit common parameters like the, the name of the patch or how the overall output level, uh, where the keys are gonna go for A. We can say tone one, the A is gonna go from a low of C1 up to, uh, let's bring it down here to D2. So now that A sound, if we turn it off everything but A, only works up, up to D because that's what we set it to. If we add higher, then we got D4. So now I've got it to D3. It means it'll play up to right there, D3 and no higher. So you can adjust where the individual layers play and you could use that to do splits and layers so, and overlap the layers. And you can actually bias that and we'll talk about that in a minute. So it kind of fades from one sound to another. All right, so that's, that's the patch manipulation and selection and editing controls. Over here, we have the performance controls. We have the overall system volume. We have a transpose button, which let me reset that patch to something else. Oh, wailing guitar. You'll know this sound. <laughs> And yes, the synthesizer has aftertouch. If you push into the aftertouch, it goes into an LFO modulation of the pitch here. And cut off. So if we look at the controls over here, we have a transpose. Most modern synthesizers allow you to transpose up or down an octave. This one, you only get one transpose setting. In this patch, it's set for an octave down. So if you press transpose, it plays an octave lower. There is no way to have multiple transpose and you can change it. So if I wanted the transpose button to play a third higher, then you can do that and store that as part of the patch. And of course we can change whether it's solo or polyphonic. And then we can also have portamento. There's not much portamento on this one. A little bit. You can hear the difference if I turn it off. And then back on. And then of course down here we have the standard rolling stick. Back in the editing mode we have what's called our palette controls here. And this is a quick and easy way that Roland got around not having 200 controls on here for everything. So let's say we wanted to edit the cutoff frequency. You can see right here on our screen, we have the cutoff frequency and there's four of them. You can see tone A, B, C, and D, and we're editing only the second one. But now that this is on our edit screen, we can use our palette sliders up here to edit all four tones. So as long as we're whatever the last thing is we've edited shows up in the edit screen here and then we can edit those values for all four tones just by using these sliders. And you could use those as performance controls if you really wanted to. Let's pick a, a different sound. Pad. So if I move to cut off again. We could also bring up resonance. And then back to cutoff. So 
So it's a quick and easy way of editing all four tones on whatever you were last touching just by edit using these four palette sliders here. Now, anytime that we have something that we're editing that is like a, an effects, for instance, we can see here, we can move through these effect sequences. And right here we have distortion, phase, uh, uh, what is SP, uh, spectrum and enhancer. And you can tell it which ones you want to turn on and off. Uh, by changing this value here. I can turn on their distortion and our phaser, which makes a horrendous noise. But you can see what I did there is I'm using the value slider to turn, turn that on and off. So if we're back in effects here and we are going to uh, balance, you can see we have dry, the dry send and the effect send for this effect. And we have a value of 50 in there and I can adjust that with the slider between the dry and the wet send. So that's how you edit items that are in the, the setup like that. You can also just do a one at a time up down button there. And we can move throughout this menu with these buttons here. If we're back down at the patch effects then we can move left and right to turn them on and off that way as well. So that's, that's editing functions that are above and beyond the sound design functions you see on the main board. All right, so now I'm in manual mode. You can see assistant Delic bass. That's just the last patch I had, but I've got manual mode turned on. So it ignores all this, what was in here before, and it's only playing exactly what you see on the, on the control panel here. So pitch envelope, we have an envelope that, and, and the, you'll notice the envelopes in here are different than ADSR. We start with a, a level zero, and then we have the time that it takes to get to level one, and then the time that it takes to get to the sustain. And then once you release, the time it takes to get to level two, which is our release. So we could make the pitch start, as, these are bipolar, so we could make the pitch start low and then take some time to get up to our, our expected pitch, and then take a little bit of time to come down to, uh, actually let's make it go up higher. And then we'll take a little bit of time to come down to our sustain pitch and then a little bit of time after which it's going to make the pitch fall down. So let's hear what that sounds like. A little too long. So, you, so now we can hear that as I press a key, it's gonna start below the pitch of a C. I'm playing a C, which is that note. It's gonna go up above the C, come back down, sit at the C until I release it, at which point it's then gonna fall off in pitch. And we can bias that with velocity. So, so the high, harder you hit it, the more effect it has. If I press it lightly, there's almost no effect. And same thing. We can also make the velocity affect the time. So the, the lighter we press it, the longer it takes. Or if we press it hard, the time goes very, very fast. So it, it kind of biases the pitch. And, and the same thing, key following. So that if we want it, um, so that it, it goes very slowly on low notes, but faster at high notes. So that's kind of how all the different envelopes work on this synthesizer. Using the pitch is a really good example just because it shows very well how it, how it actually does that. I'm gonna set these all back to zero so that uh, we don't, we can uh, play with the other features in here, which should just give us a single pitch. Over here, we have the TVF and the TVA envelopes. Uh, time variant filter, time variant amplitude. Now these are kind of like our ADSR envelopes. However, they're not ADSR because if you look, we have way more than just four controls. Once again, we have the amount of time it takes to get to the first level, amount of time to get to the second level, and then an amount of time it gets to the sustain, and then we have our release. And you can see the envelopes on there. So if we want to adjust the envelope for the amplitude, we can say we want to take some time to get up to a very high level and then some time to come down to a very quiet level. And then we want to take some time and get very loud and then go away 
when we release the key. So you can see just by pressing one key, I'm getting two different ramps there because I've drawn that in here. And then the exact same things apply to the pitch envelope. We can bias that with velocity, uh, time, velocity. Uh, it, with velocity changes the level, time velocity changes the, the uh, bias of how much the time is going to shorten or long, lengthen. And the same thing if we want to do key following so the time expands faster the higher we play. And you can make this bipolar so we could actually make play slower if we push this down. You can see that takes quite a bit longer. Now if I press a low note, it goes much faster because I put this into the negative territory. So all these controls are nicely bipolar. We have the exact same thing with a filter. Um, it works exactly the same as the amplitude, except it controls the filter rather than the, the amplitude envelope. So I'm not gonna bother making you sit through all that, but let's once again turn all these back. Well, let's, let's throw a little bit of filter in there just so we have something to hear. We'll make it um, snap a little bit of a... Now I've got the filter set up so that you can hear it comes up and then it comes down and then it comes up a little bit more to the sustain and then it lets go. So let's put a little bit of time in there. If we put a little more time in there. All right, so now we have our filter set up with the amplitude as well. So there's the sound we've created. Down here, if we look right below the TVA envelope settings, we have the controls that control all of this. So we have the, the amount of level, which is how much envelope we're gonna get. And we have a bias direction and point and level. And what this is for is when we are splitting sounds across the key bed, we can change the bias level and point so that instead of a cutoff, if we have tone A coming to uh, this C here and tone B starting here, using the bias point and level, we can actually make it so that instead of a hard cutoff, it kind of like overlaps like that. And that's what the bias point and level does. And we can also cause the aftertouch to have effect. So if I put that up here and I push hard into one of the keys, you can hear it gets louder because I've got the aftertouch turned on. Or I can do it, it's bipolar, so I can pull it down. So when I push into the aftertouch, it actually gets quieter. We have two LFOs to select from, which I'll talk about in just a moment, but we can link to either of them, link all, either of those LFOs into the amplitude envelope, either a positive or a negative. The only thing different on the filter that we have, we have a cutoff frequency, obviously, and resonance. And we can change it from high pass, band pass, and low pass. Again, we can adjust the LFO and aftertouch to affect the, the filter just like we can on the amplitude. The only additional thing that we have is our key follow. Of course, envelope selects how much of this is actually going to affect our filter. And then key follow changes how much the filter opens as you move up the keyboard. So it's going to, it's going to be very closed down low and very open up above or we can, it's bipolar, so we can, we can do the opposite. High, open on the bottom, closed on the top. Let's talk about those LFOs for a moment. You can see the LFO, we have a variety of different waveforms, including uh, random, sample, and hold. So let's uh, look at LFO 2. We will connect that to, oh, I don't know, how about the, um, Frequency. So I can change the LFO so that instead of it's working as a bipolar, it's it's from zero, it's only acting down below or above, or it's bipolar, and you can change the waveform. That's a very famous sound. 
And then it's just random. You can also make it so that it takes some time for the LFO to start taking effect with the delay and the how long it takes for it to fade away. So if I press a key, we have delay, and then it fades away as well if we have it set to do that. We can change the velocity curve of the key bed if we like, if it's, uh, we want to change it for, if you find yourself having to pound on the key bed to have the velocity take effect, you can change that curve very quickly right there. The wave generator, and this is the real fun part of this synthesizer. First we have obviously our pitch. And let's get rid of the LFO over here so we can hear what we're doing. Fine and coarse pitch. We can also have random pitch so that every time we press a key, it randomizes the pitch a little bit. Key follow changes how the, the pitch control is scaled to the key bed. Normally we want this at 100, which is 100%, which is normal. So we have 100, which means the key bed is going to work as expected. If we bring the key follow down to zero, now every key on the keyboard is going to play the exact same note. And we can also make it, it's bipolar, so we can make it negative. So if we go negative 100, now the keyboard is going to play in reverse. It goes higher as you go lower, and lower as you go higher. And of course, you can make it go the other way, so it's, it's crazy, so it's 200%. Now I play a chromatic scale. It's, it's skipping every other half note, half tone rather. So that is part of the, the pitch generator system. Let's put that back to 100. Over here, we can change uh, how the LFOs are affecting the wave. There's LFO one, LFO two. And also the aftertouch mod. So if we push uh, this up here and we push into aftertouch, it's going to bring in some modulation from LFO one. Or I could have it do the same thing for LFO two. And the level of aftertouch modulation is dependent on how much pressure you apply. Same thing goes for the lever. It's going to affect, if I push upwards on the lever, it's going to bring in LFO1. Or if I bring it down here, LFO2. Or none at all. All right, now we get to the waveform section. We have two sources, internal or card. If we look at internal, then we can change what the waveform is that we're going to be hearing. So here's synth saw. Bring down the resonance. So you can see some, some standard sounds in here. Synthesizers, uh, sawtooth, square tooth, pulse. But there's, there's over a hundred in here. And some of them are obvious samples. Box sample. And you can hear in here there is an attack portion. However, then it just loops through the rest of that sample so that you can hear the sound. In terms of storing your tones, once you've created them, you have banks here you can write to, you can compare, you can transfer MIDI, transfer in and out. You can copy from one to another. Okay, so let's go into our effects. We can have up to four effects on an individual tone and we can change what we want those effects to be. So here we've got distortion, phaser. So let's change it to phaser. And then the next one, we want to make that uh, oh, enhancer, whatever that is. 
and then uh, distortion and then it's spectrum. Okay, so now that we've done that, we can actually change which ones we want to turn on. So let's turn on phaser. Or we can turn, there's our enhance, which doesn't really do a whole lot. Our spectrum, which is again, not doing much. And then we have our distortion, which does a whole lot. And then we also have in our sequence B, we have our chorus delay and reverb. So let's turn on all of those. Yes, we want chorus. Actually, let's go back and turn off our distortion. Okay, so now we go into B, we're gonna turn on our chorus. And delay. And our reverb. Let's turn off the delay so we can hear the reverb. I don't hear much reverb, so let's have a look and see. Uh, effect balance, let's put more effects in there. And then if we go into, we can see the chorus setup uh, and we can go into reverb setup. So we'll go into reverb setup. We have a bunch of different hall uh, reverbs we can have. Let's say room. three and then pre-delay time re early reverb level uh, high frequency damp we can turn on the time so now we should have long there's our reverb and put it way up there so for a 1991 synthesizer the reverb is not bad at all so if we can go back out of here and back to our chorus. Let's uh, actually go back to those effects and we'll turn on our delay as well. So now we have our chorus, delay, and reverb. Pretty decent effects that are all DSP effects for a 1991 synthesizer. All right, that's it about the Roland JD800. I hope I covered everything that is of interest to you. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. If you like this video, you'd like to see more like it, please click like on this video. Subscribe to the channel, it really helps me out. Thanks for watching.